There's little doubt that consumers crave low oil prices. But good news at the global pump for many can lead to fiscal and political catastrophe for oil exporting countries. A panel of regional and global experts provided analysis of the short and long-term implications of falling oil prices during a recent Wilson Center event. That's the focus of this edition of Rewind. Today's topic, low oil prices, is especially timely. If we maintain $80 per barrel or less, there will likely be the equivalent of another economic stimulus for consumers, and it will also put additional pressure on producers. Of course, prolonged low prices are a hypothesis, and we certainly know from history that what goes down can also go up in the oil and gas business. Most oil producers have come to depend in their budgets on oil prices of $100 per barrel or more. A price drop of 20 to 25 percent will surely put them in a squeeze, and the issues will be their budget flexibility, their reserves, and of course the duration of the price drop. Nigeria is the, um, ten, the world's tenth um, most um, important oil producer in value terms, and so most people view Nigeria as a resource-rich country. I see it more as a resource-driven country, because if you look at um, oil in Nigeria per capita, it doesn't even make the top 20. Um, it's re resource driven because oil <coughs> revenues and oil investment drive not just the oil but the non-oil economy there. So in terms of trade, we're seeing um, in 2008, 46% uh, of all Nigeria's exports came here to the United States. And now it's uh, probably tending towards single digits. What that means is that there has to be significant trade diversion from the Nigerian side, which in many cases would be um, a little more costly um, for Nigeria. And so margins are going to be slimmer as, um, oil pri as declining oil prices begin to hurt. As, as many of you probably know, the, the oil prices really make or break for Venezuela in particular when we think about countries in Latin America, but also countries um, globally that are, that are oil producers. Oil represents 96% of Venezuela's uh, exports. And critically, oil export revenue is the main source of dollars for a country that's highly dependent on basic imported goods. To date, what we've seen is that higher oil prices have offset um, kind of the production declines and eliminated the government's urgency in addressing some of the, the issues in the oil sector. However, I would say that the, the oil price here is, is really critical, and if, if the government um, does have much lower levels of, of export revenue with which to import basic goods, um, it could accelerate the risk of, of a political crisis and, um, and be the kind of uh, catalyst for the, the base to finally say enough is enough and to um, take to the streets and really demand some sort of political change. The situation in Russia is, is, is very similar to those in Nigeria and Venezuela. Um, <laughs> things aren't looking very rosy in the short term, that's for sure. Uh, the obvious consequence of the drop in oil is a loss of revenue. Uh, almost 50% of the Russian budget comes from oil, uh, oil revenue, and that has obviously decreased, and that means less money for a variety of, of programs put forward by President Putin. In conjunction with the sanctions, the fall in the price of oil has had a really devastating short-term impact on Russia's energy producers. Uh, they were engaged in various joint ventures in the Arctic, those are now off the table because of U.S. sanctions. Uh, the oil companies in Russia cannot get Western financing. Again, that's not possible because of oil sanctions, because of the Western sanctions after the Crimea, as a result of the Crimea crisis. The Saudis are very well positioned to, to take this battle on. They are uh, long, been long considered the swing producer in the world because they have a capacity to produce 12.5 million barrels a day, and right now they are producing about 9.6 million barrels. So th they can go up if there's a shortage somewhere, and they can go down. And what strikes me is there is this enormous scramble among oil producers for a share of the Chinese market. And <coughs> China has started going around the world and, and buying uh, oil at the lowest price you know, that they can find. To my mind, one of the 
most important initiatives that can be undertaken at this point is one that deals with energy poverty. You know, over 1.4 billion people do not have access to electricity in the world. If we have a, a, a dividend, it seems to me that there are domestic economic initiatives, as I mentioned, that could be taken to take advantage of that dividend. There are international initiatives. If we can have borderless transmission lines, if we can get into development of electric power sources for people who are in poorer countries, these are important steps to take. I think one has to have some imagination here and not just say, uh, you know, what do we do about the kleptocrats? Well, they're going to keep on taking their take. They are going to be there, and the other people are going to be poorer and poorer. That's going to be the general perspective. But there are positive things that can be, can be done, and they have to be done soon in order to take advantage of this window of opportunity. For more information, visit wilsoncenter.org. Click the Programs tab to find additional resources from the Center's Canada and Kennan Institutes and from its Latin American, Africa, and Middle East programs.